So, um, as, as Miles said, I'm a clinician. Uh, I work in Bristol and in London in Moorfields, uh, and I'm also a laboratory scientist. And so I work in the field of what we call translational medicine. And my task today is to try and explain how translational medicine works. I'm going to be talking about inflammatory eye diseases as a whole. So birdshot is a type of inflammatory eye disease, but even uveitis is itself a rare disease, and, uh, and it's classified as an orphan indication for treatment by the various um, drug regulatory authorities. And so I'm going to um, show what's going on internationally and, and the various um, institutions and people who are involved in this sort of research in inflammatory eye diseases, just to give a flavor um, in 10 to 15 minutes, and also show how we're trying to contribute to that through government-funded programs within the United Kingdom. And after my talk, um, there's going to be a session where the panel members, some of the speakers that you've already seen, will come up and we'll try and put that in the context of birdshot chorioretinopathy. So when we think about medical research, um, we professionally tend, tend to put the research on, on this sort of spectrum. And we can actually place some of the talks you've heard today um, against this diagram. So, Basic research would typically be considered to be some of the fundamental biology that tells us about um, how cells work. And we've, we've heard of that in, in mitochondria. And, uh, and there are many examples where basic understanding of the way the immune system works goes on to inform what we do as clinical practitioners. Then we can refine some of those concepts in a more clinically applicable way. So we can think of them in the context of specific diseases. So we've been talking today about birdshot chorioretinopathy, and, uh, and there are a wider efforts in the field of uveitis as, as a whole. If there is a new drug target that we think could be beneficial, so for example, if ERAP um, is found to be very critical in the biological mechanism of birdshot chorioretinopathy, and somebody finds a way of modulating the function of, of ERAP, and that's demonstrated in preclinical studies. We then go into early clinical trials, and these are what are called proof of concept studies, where a new agent, a new drug typically, is con considered and evaluated in a small population of patients. The doctors know what the patients are taking, the patients know what they're taking, and we're looking for early signals of biological effects, and we often don't know which drug dose to use. And at this point, it's an it's early scoping exercise. But if that proof of principle is demonstrated, we then can scale up. And by scaling up, we tend to go to large, large um, phase three trials, as they're called, which normally are not undertaken by single institutions. And at this point, the ball is often handed over from academia to large scale um, pharmaceutical companies. And they're often run um, not only nationally, internationally. And it's the data from those later phase trials which then goes on to inform the regulators about whether to license a drug for a particular indication. So in this circumstance, um, say we've got a new um, ERAP modulator that we think is going to help birdshot. We've done our proof of concept study. We've then gone into a late phase clinical trial. We've managed to get all the birdshot at internationally, which is a great um, challenge in a rare disease to participate in a, in a phase three study and that data is then submitted to the regulatory authorities in the United States, the FDA, in Europe, the EMA. And they will decide whether to license the drug. And then with each, within each of our healthcare systems, we then have to decide whether that licensed drug is going to be used. And that means, is, is it affordable and cost, cost effective? And the way that's um, applied varies enormously internationally. And in the UK, um, we speak to our commissioners in NHS England. And as Miles said, we've, there's been a, a, a dialogue involving many professionals for a couple of years, specifically around some of the biologic therapies to try and, uh, and present the evidence as favorably as possible to the commissioners to, to prove benefit and cost effectiveness. And so this is the spectrum that we work on. But it's quite simplified, and I just put it um, in, in the paradigm of a, of a new drug, and this is drug development. But in reality, a lot of what we've heard today isn't as simple as that. Somebody doesn't just come with a concept and take it through. That actually normally takes decades. What often happens is we'll have a clinical observation. And so in Carlos's talk, we were hearing that he thinks that certain types of treatments will help in birdshot in particular, and maybe not in other forms of uveitis the same way. And, uh, and, and, and the, the whole spectrum then can cross-inform, and the arrows don't need to go in one direction. 
But there are two particular parts of this pathway um, in which the government funding in the UK through the National Institute for Health Research, which is the main research and development funding in the National Health Service, there's, there's two particular areas where investment is made. And this is in trying to catalyze the jump from ideas which may have benefit for patients to get into early phase clinical trials, and that's what we could call gap one. And then there's the jump to get um, from late phase, late phase trials to be clinically applicable, and that's gap two. And that gap two we, we tend to call um, applied healthcare research, and, the, and the, the gap one where we're getting into early phase trials to look at proof of concept is um, experimental medicine or translational medicine. And, uh, and we're fortunate in, in the UK um, to have specific investment in ophthalmology um, in experimental medicine through a biomedical research centre which is uh, based at Moorfields Eye, Eye Hospital. As I said, for bird shots, actually things are mixed up as, as data comes from different parts of this pathway at different times. So when we look internationally, there are a range of uh, very active, talented clinicians globally who have an interest in inflammatory eye diseases. And if you look at the medical literature, and again, some of the, the presentations seen examples of this, there are different levels of evidence, or evidence quality, as some of the regulators or healthcare commissions will call it. And so um, I, as a doctor, may see a patient with an unusual condition, and I may want to document that and report it to my colleagues in the literature, and that would be a case report. But it's unusual for a case report to then inform spending and inform commissioning of care. Groups of doctors sometimes work together in consortia. Um, but more typically, the way research works, and you've heard this today as well, is that individual expertise is gained in individual centers. And there tends to be for inflammatory eye diseases, um, centers of excellence and expertise. And the main ones I'm going to focus on are in the United States and the United Kingdom. But typically, the investment for that research has come to individual researchers and their teams within individual institutions. And so I'm just going to, to add to the names you've heard today from the, the UK environment and UK community to just tell you about some of the people internationally who work in inflammatory eye diseases. And none of them are specifically focused um, on, on Birdshot alone, but Birdshot is incorporated within um, the programmes of work they, un they undertake. And so this first group of researchers um, are those that, um, that uh, we, we're not mature enough with inflammatory eye diseases to have a clear distinction between applied healthcare research and experimental medicine, as you would do in some of the larger diseases like rheumatology. Um, but but the, the researchers that I've presented here are largely looking at application of treatments to, to patients in a clinical environment. And, uh, and on uh, the west coast of the States, we have Eric Sula. And I just mentioned these names. If you put them into PubMed, you'd find things out about inflammatory eye diseases. Um, there's uh, Quan Nguyen, um, who's based in, in Nebraska. Um, and then on the east coast, we have Steve Foster, who's up on the top left, um, Doug Jabs, John Kempen, and Nita, Nita Sen. And if you put those names into PubMed, you'll get a range of publications that will tell you about inflammatory eye diseases and show you how the clinicians who are interested in the field are, tr are trying to report what they see in clinic and trying to assimilate that data so that it's useful to the community as a whole. And then if we go back to the more laboratory orientated research and the people who are, uh, who are focused more on experimental medicine, I'm going to add a few other names in the United States. So Jim Rosenbaum, who's top on, on the left, um, Narsing Rao, he also does a lot of clinical research, Russ Van Gelder, the arrow goes off to Adelaide in, in Australia for Justine Smith, and Bodness and Blatt at the National Institute in the United States. And so these are a community of individuals who between them sometimes collaborate, but, but often work on, on projects which are centered on their own institution. Then if you look across Europe, I'm leaving the UK out because you've seen um, much of the, of the UK expert base um, here today. Um, in France, uh, you have Baran Badagi. In Spain, Alfredo Adan. Um, and we've heard about the activity in, in Utrecht already from, from Jonas. And um, uh, Manfred Zierhut in, in Germany, Karl Herbert in Switzerland, um, and Ignor Tultuk in, in Turkey. And so, um, and so together, this is a community, but there aren't actually that many pictures. I can fit it onto the map reasonably well, and it's a rare disease. And if you were to do this in rheumatology, or if you were to do this in cardiovascular medicine or oncology, you wouldn't be able to fit all the pictures on, onto the page. And so we are a small piece of the jigsaw within medical research as a whole. So I'm going to focus now on where the British government is investing in research in 
this first translational gap to get um, new ideas in disease-specific treatments into the clinic. And, uh, and the context of that is the Biomedical Research Centre, which is based at Moorfields. The inflammation part of the Biomedical Research Centre is actually split. And, uh, and is um, the first example of best practice in this research domain really being spread across um, institutions within the NHS, and so it's formally partnered with um, University Hospitals Bristol and University of Bristol, and Andrew Dick and I work between both London and Bristol in delivering um, this programme of, of uh, early phase research and patient care. We've been very lucky, though, um, really because of the government base to the funding to, all, to also look further afield, and, and this is our attempt to, to challenge the, the usual status quo of, uh, of of institutional specific and research specific funding. And through close affiliation with the National Eye Institute in the United States, which is the US government funded experimental medicine base, we formed a consortium called UNITE, which is the, the universities and national institutes transatlantic eye consortium for human ocular immunology. Our basis is, is looking at research in human beings and, and patients. And we established this um, in 2012. Um, this is the photograph on the left hand side. And this is trying to make sure that we scale up, because there's only a, a few individuals here, and for all the patients that we have in the room today, if you expand that across inflammatory eye, eye diseases, if we're really to have an impact and make um, change, changes to the opportunities in inflammatory eye diseases um, in a meaningful time frame, we have to work together. And that's essentially the collaborative um, basis of the consortium. And, uh, and the laboratories are truly joined. This isn't a, um, a, even though I use the term collaboration, it's not a traditional scientific collaboration. The teams in the United Kingdom and the teams in the US who work in the, in the labs and also the clinical teams video conference on a weekly basis and the program of work is entirely joined up so that the government funded core research in the UK and the US comes together in a coordinated way for inflammatory eye diseases as a whole. And then a year later in 2013, um, that was extended um, at a non-clinical but um, more uh, laboratory research level to um, the State Laboratory for Ophthalmology in China, in Guangzhou in China. And so this is, uh, is attempting to bring together for ocular inflammatory diseases the expertise and research base and resources and technology, some of which you've seen applied in the earlier talks, of both the UK government funded programme, US and, and, and the Chinese. And a lot of this simply wouldn't have been possible without um, modern communications, but actually it's very easy using simple um, uh, uh, software, which most of you have on, on your home computers, to communicate um, with people across the globe and coordinate programs of scientific work. This is quite um, uh, involved and in depth now, and I'm not proposing for a second to go through every bullet point here, but it's to show the range of activity that's been undertaken through this consortium across these sites. It's exchange of people, so exchange of PhD students, for example. We have postdoctoral fellows. And inflammatory eye diseases are not just uveitis. We also know that inflammation contributes to abnormalities in the retina and macular degeneration, which affects older people, um, as, as Pierce described earlier. And we also know that it um, plays a key role in diabetic retinopathy, among other um, site-threatening conditions. And so there's a, there's a range of programs here, and, and this needs uh, quite a framework of administrative support. And we've also moved into early phase clinical trials, and this is also a challenge to make sure that the systems we use to collect data are robust and standardized across the UK and the US. And, and to bring this together, there have been a number of meetings between the investigators. And all these efforts are actually trying to create a platform which will deliver patient benefit, but we need direction in how to deliver that benefit. And we've heard a lot today about the sorts of questions that you would like to be answered. And, uh, and that's informed much of what we've done, done already, but there's, uh, there's, there's much further to discuss around that, which we'll do later. There were two key um, programs of work under the consortium that I wanted to highlight for you. One's called ocular immune phenotyping. By phenotyping, all that means is characterizing. We are describing the way the eyes look. Today, there's been much discussion about the definition of birdshot, what birdshot is. Do you need to be A29 positive or not to have a diagnosis of birdshot? And as doctors, we do subclassify in order to try and optimize therapy and also be able to give better advice on prognosis for individual groups of patients with individual types of eye inflammation. And so in this program of work, this is just ex explained through a flowchart how a patient with eye inflammation would essentially be subclassified 
in a research program so that it, once they present to uh, to one of our hospitals, if they have the opportunity to participate. So we would simply describe their disease, sometimes using the sorts of technologies that you saw Pierce display, but at the same time is clinically characterizing the disease using some of these, uh, these high-end technologies. We'd also want to be looking at the way the immune system is working in those patients. And currently we do that by taking blood samples, and there may be more advanced ways of doing that, which I'll, which I'll mention in the last slide. So you've already seen in the supercell talk from, from Birmingham um, the, the um, flow cytometry data of this sort. And, um, and just to um, recap on some of that, it's possible to take a blood sample from anybody in this audience and to put it through a machine and to, to visualize every single cell from that blood sample. And for each individual cell, at the same time, we can work out which proteins that cell is expressing, both on the cell surface and internally. There's a huge challenge in then reconciling all that data. And you heard Jonas talk about bioinformatics and, and how this information can then be tabled together. But ultimately, we're looking for the molecular signatures that he was talking about in the context of birdshot chorioretinopathy. And what we're trying to achieve is a particular description or characterization of the way the eye looks and align that to the way we think the immune system works. And alongside that, if we know that somebody's got a particular immune deviation or abnormality associated with a particular appearance in the eye, we're hopeful that we would then be able to, to be more effective in terms of the diagnostic tests we use and also more effective in terms of the treatments that we, that we, um, that we use in a targeted fashion to personalize it. Because even though we're all talking about birdshot chorioretinopathy today, it's clear that every, every one of yours in independent experience of birdshot is slightly different. And so this is trying to get to a more individualized level and to be more personalized in what we do. I'm going to skip over this because Jonas talked about it, but it's, it's really quite remarkable for, for each individual who participates in these sorts of studies. We can look at, at over 40,000 genes and combine that data across groups of patients. And this sort of technology is really enabling us now to, to probe at a personalized level difference in characteristics of our immune responses, and we hope that we can then align that to therapy. We're also very lucky to have advanced imaging, and although we have a disadvantage in ophthalmology of not being able to take samples of material very easily from the eye to look at under the microscope, which would tell us quite a lot about the biology of the abnormality in the eye for birdshot, for example, we are able to now look at it in high resolution. Pierce alluded to um, the next generation of imaging applications that are going to be coming to the clinic. What I'm showing you here is a research tool called Adaptive Optics, and what you've got on the, on the uh, left-hand side of the screen as you look at it is, it is in a live human retina, individual photoreceptors, both cones and rods, um, visualized um, in real time. And what I'm showing you in the video, uh, individual cells going through the blood vessels of a patient's retina in real, in real time. We've got uh, a project which is starting in, in the UK in the new year, which is going to try and track fluorescently labeled cells within a retina, and that will enable us to look at the immune response for the first time live in a human being to understand if some of these things we think we've learned from the laboratory before are really applicable to somebody with inflammatory eye disease. These concepts um, are very exciting, but I also feel very cautious in these sorts of environments about giving a promise that we can apply this world of new technology to, uh, to make a step change in the care that you receive. This is a long way away from some of the questions we've heard about the practicalities of receiving immunosuppressive